but I never really thought about that connection. And you're absolutely right. When you said that there was a connection between them, that's great similarity. I thought, no, <laughs> I was stunned and stumped because <laughs> I think of the, those two women as being so completely different. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. So you want to find someone you're compatible with, specifically someone who's ready for a serious connection, totally open to having kids in the future, is a tall rock climbing Libra and loves rom-coms with vegan pizzas on Tuesdays just as much as you do. Bumble knows that you know exactly what's right for you. So whatever it is you're looking for, Bumble's features can help you find it. Date now on Bumble. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. You're listening to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast with Rebecca Larson. For those of you who are new to the Tudor period, Jane Boleyn was a sister-in-law to Anne Boleyn, married to her brother George. She served all but the last Tudor queen, and her life, like many well-known names of the time, ended in execution. But before her brutal end, she had a long career at court. Today, I welcome Dr. James Taft to the show to discuss his book, Courting Scandal, The Rise and Fall of Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford. James, welcome. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. What made you choose Jane as the topic of your book? Uh, well, it kind of snowballed from my early research. So when I was um, a very humble undergraduate, I was researching the executions of Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. And as many will know, Jane Boleyn had a sort of integral role in both of those uh, Queen's downfalls. So while my focus then wasn't on Jane specifically, she is what really intrigued me by the end of what, what I was writing. And I was fortunate enough to have the chance to continue that research um, at a different institution. And Jane was then again, a case study. She was she was not the focus still, but she was very much she was very much there and continued to fascinate me, continued to confound me. I was she was such an enigma, but I really wanted to know who is this woman, what was she doing, and why. And um, and then when I finished there and fin well, essentially finished education for a while, I started writing about her because I thought, well, we do have a biography of Jane um, already, an excellent one, but I felt like I had a very different view, and. I also felt like writing about Jane would allow me to say some of the things I wanted to say about court life and about how women experienced court life. Jane sort of insisted upon being the subject because her name is recurs so often in the surviving source material, whereas for other women, you only have very scant references. Jane is she's she's she wants to be center of attention <laughs> is the impression that I get, but no, no, um, she, she just makes an excellent case study. And that, that's why I think I picked her up. One of the things I learned from your book was that she was at court much earlier than even I realized. Can you maybe touch on her position in Catherine of Aragon's household? Absolutely. Yes. So Jane served Catherine as one of her maids of honor who were young unmarried daughters of English noblemen and women. These girls were companions of the queen and often accompanied her when she left her chambers, you know, carrying her train behind her, as you as you can quite imagine. But perhaps the most important sort of prerequisite to Jane's position as a maid was her appearance and her beauty. And although we have no um, likenesses of Jane or any contemporary portraits, so we don't really know what she looked like, it is almost safe to assume that she was at least pleasant looking because Henry VIII, um, for instance, once remarked that the Queen's Maids of Honor should be fair or meet for the room, as he said, which was quite something coming from him, as I can't imagine when he said that, that he was very meet for the room. <laughs> um, but yes, in other words, the Queen's Maids essentially adorned the King's court. They were like the jewels in his crown. And by her beauty, but also by her sort of charm and wit, Jane would have the role, the responsibility of fostering good relations with any visitors at court. And also wherever they went on progress, if they ever, uh, you know, went like, for instance, the field of cloth of gold, um, that would have been partly her responsibility there too. Uh, English nobles, foreign ambassadors, dignitaries, people like that. And although the material for Henry's reign sort of speaks for itself, what really clarified this for me was I found a reference in 
the household ordinances of Henrietta Maria, which were from a century later, but did sort of, I think, confirm what was already in practice, which was that maids were expected to be present in the Queen's chambers whenever ambassadors were in attendance. It was almost like a rule. So it wasn't accidental that maids like Jane had this role. It was it was it was ordained, you know, it was it was kind of it was expected. Now, this might seem like an odd question, but was Jane present at the birth of future Mary the first? I mean, I think I can probably I don't think I could prove that she wasn't because we really don't have enough evidence to know when Jane was born. But all of the coincidental sort of evidence that might indicate when Jane was born would probably suggest that she was too young at the time of Mary's birth to have been one of Catherine's ladies. We do know we do have a remark by George Cavendish, uh, who was a servant of Cardinal Wolsey's. He wrote that Jane was brought up in the court from a young age, but that's obviously quite an obscure remark that doesn't really tell us very much. And um, there is a reference to a Mistress Parker at the Field of Cloth of Gold in 1520, which is about four years after Mary's birth. And I think it's fairly not conclusive, certainly not conclusive, but it's fairly convincing to suggest that that's when she made her debut, because also in attendance on the Queen's side were her parents, Henry and Alice. And although but now that I think about it and think about your question, it's not implausible that Henry and Alice would have visited uh, Catherine and Mary at court and a young Jane might have trailed behind them, if not serving in Catherine's household, you know, prob and probably most certainly wasn't there at the birth, might have met a very, very young Mary. You know, there's no reason to believe that there were children who were brought to court um, on occasion. We know that. So Jane could have been one of those who, as they say, brought up in the court in the young age. She could have experienced court life before she was actually appointed in Catherine's household. Now, you've mentioned the Field of Cloth of Gold a couple of times, and we know it as this magnificent event. And the Queen's ladies had to look their very best. Oh, yes. I, I, I'm always curious how... How did they pay for these things? And what did we know about the gown maybe that Jane would have needed for this event? How long would it have taken to be made? Do you know? Wow, um, that's quite a question. I would say, well, for the visual material culture of the Queen's household, anything to do with silk women and wardrobes and tailoring, was probably a little bit outside of my expertise, but there were some wonderful works that you can consult. I would recommend um, Maria Hayward or Michelle Beer for like a more comprehensive version of that. I try not to put too much detail into things that I don't necessarily understand, but I would say that in terms of how long a gown would have taken, I would maybe say it could be anywhere up to two weeks, but perhaps no longer than that if it was needed urgently. And you can imagine like when an occasion sort of arose. So when they announced the Field of Cloth of Gold or say, um, oh, a good example would be when Catherine of Aragon died and they, they had a funeral for her, but they would only have known that the funeral was coming, you know, two weeks before it was scheduled. And um, Henry wrote a letter to one of the women who he wanted to attend in Catherine's funeral, I think her Grace, Lady Beddingfield. And he even sent her a certain amount of black cloth for her own attire, but also for her servants. But this is not the gown, this is just the cloth. So Lady Beddingfield still had to arrange for these mourning garments to be made up. And although I think he sent it to her very, very shortly after Catherine's death, she would have had no more than two weeks to get it made up. And I kind of imagine this very poor silk woman having this order come through. 13 garments, please, in 13 days. You know, quite the task, I imagine. Wow. Although then I, then I suppose there were these London companies which, which had like, you know, apprentices and they would have had several silk women to do this job. But I don't imagine, I don't, I don't envy that silk woman who suddenly had an order come through. And, you know, if you know it came from the court or the king or the queen or or a noble woman even, would you dare turn it down? You know, that, right. of course not. So um, I think you also mentioned what was the expense yeah. of how 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 much would they have had to have incurred when they when they were at court and i think certainly the costs of attending court is thought to have outpaced the amount that they actually got in return that's often what is said but i'm not sure that's true i think in if i think theoretically yes the wages were really meager we know that i mean probably not nearly enough to endure what that many of them had to at the court. But when a young um, Anne Bassett was appointed as a maid of honor in 
1537, I believe, her mother, Lady Lyle, was to be informed that the Queen would be at no more cost with her, but her wages and livery. And it was reiterated again later that the Queen would give her but £10 a year. And that's sort of the use of the word but is up from, from the agent is to suggest that that's all she's going to get. And it's like, the, the I might be reading a little bit too much into that comment, but it sort of sounded like, yeah, this is all she's going to get for being at court and you will have to foot the bill for the rest. But And being at court was a considerable financial investment, but I think for families like the Lyles, it would have been worth it because the, hopefully the return that you would get with nearness to the king or queen and the sort of corresponding influence that you would have as a result made it worth their while to put the to put the investment in. One of the things I learned from your book, I guess I learned a lot. I'm going to keep saying one of the things I learned. Uh, well, that's wonderful. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> it was interesting to me that you mentioned the livery. And when I imagine livery in my head, I imagine the king's men, Henry VIII, wearing a large HR on their chest. But the queen's right. servants also wore livery. And I guess I, I, I figured they dressed the same. But could you explain maybe what type of livery Jane would have worn in her time in the queen's household? Yes, I can certainly try. I mean, there are many accounts in terms of what well, wardrobe accounts that give us such rich detail about what the Tudors wore and what their servants wore too. You know, comparatively with other areas, it's actually quite substantial how much evidence has survived. And as Jane served five of Henry's six queens, what she wore would have definitely changed over time. Not necessarily the items of clothing, but how they looked and how they were fashioned, um, what colors they were. And, you know, not unlike the king's gentlemen, as you say, with the large HR, their livery um, would often have been embroidered too with like the queen's heraldic badge or, you know, their motto. So just to use an example, I think um, colors, colors are quite difficult, but because they vary. But at every coronation or funeral, Jane would have been issued with a red or black cloth um, to make up a livery gown for that occasion. But my impression from the evidence is that actually they wore red and black quite a lot too at court. It wasn't like it was strictly reserved for those occasions. And also tawny, tawny um, which is like a lightish brown orange color, seems to come up quite a lot in the evidence. And I think it also depends what position you hold. So watching livery is like something that the yeomen of the chamber would have worn. That's That would have looked quite different than the gowns that the women would have worn, of course. But uh, when, just thinking as well about... If we think about fashions, when she served Catherine of Aragon, her livery probably featured some kind of Spanish element, like uh, like a, maybe emblems, like pomegranates, um, sheaves of arrows. And we know that some of Catherine's English ladies definitely adopted Spanish fashions or wore Spanish sleeves, for instance. I imagine many of your uh, listeners will already know this, but certain fashions were popularized by queens. So like Anne Boleyn with the French hood, and although she didn't introduce it to the Tudor court, I think she probably did popularize it among her ladies because when Jane Seymour succeeded her, French fashions were out. It was like, that is so last season, let's get it out of here. You know, she did not want any French hoods, any French fashions. And I think that was just her way of differentiating herself from Anne Boleyn, from her predecessor. So Jane's appearance, surely between those two households, at least, would have looked quite different and probably quite frustrating for her to have to, you know, park all of her existing outfits and all of her existing wear and uh, have a whole new set made up. And again, the Lyle letters, such wonderful material do actually illustrate how much work it took to bring together a complete wardrobe for a servant. You no, know, they did actually have to look, well, fabulous. They had mm -hmm. to look extraordinary because they were attending upon someone even more extraordinary. And I think the only thing I haven't really touched on there is mottos and the famous one is Anne Boleyn who when she adopted the motto that kind of politically charged statement which it's in French so I'm not going to butcher it for your lovely listeners but um, it essentially translated means what will be will be grumble who may and I can quite easily imagine Jane wore this livery because when that motto was sort of relevant she was absolutely firmly aligned with the Boleyns and supported Anne's rise to queenship in those years so I, I, I quite like to imagine that these are the these are the sort of garments that Jane would have worn. Um, but in terms of, I mean, as, as, oh, I shouldn't even I should never forget that the inventories of her goods um, and all the things that she had when she died, they do detail in very rich, rich detail what she wore, what she had, you know, and, and that is so 
that, that's almost unrivaled that source it's, it's wonderful to read I would, and I think I actually quoted at length in the book because I wanted everyone a chance to read it in full just to see what she might have worn probably could have done more with that material but again maybe a little bit outside of my expertise mm -hmm. I, I might leave that to to Hayward <laughs> what a great resource though um, not everybody is afforded oh, such yeah. a thing I do want to know, though, so you mentioned that they would wear this motto. Uh, where would it go? Was it embroidered into their dress? Was it a sash? Where, how was it displayed? Oh, Rebecca, you are challenging me. I, have, <laughs> <laughs> I really I really don't know. I, um, I, I, can, I can often imagine it being sort of, I know that some of the badges for Catherine uh, Parr's household were pinned to hats, which sort of makes sense, mm -hmm. um, pit hats or bonnets. I can't imagine a motto would go very cleanly on the hat but I also quite I almost can't really imagine it across the front you know it's not like a sort of sister suffragette sash you know it's not I can't imagine I just can't picture it even though they say it was embroidered into the livery it must have been quite small surely I yeah. mean it, it's hard it's hard to imagine I, I I would love I know that there are some lovely um people working you know on Tudor tailoring and I imagine that they would have an excellent answer for that and I'm slightly tempted to to go and ask them after this <laughs> just because I'm curious now that you mention it I'll stop asking you about their fashion now <laughs> okay okay well I, I'm I'm showing that's not my strong suit uh, <laughs> but, but it is equally fascinating and I am so in awe of anyone who can do um the visual and material culture of things I I really do lean heavily on other people's work for that because I I find it just so fascinating. Well, let's chat about the oath of office that the, the king and queen servants had to swear to. How did this become a problem when Catherine of Aragon? Well, you know what? Before we even go into that. Right. What was the oath? Do we know? Did each queen have the same oath? Was it similar to the king's? What do we know about that? Right. Yes. I mean, I have a, a chapter in the book on oaths and loyalties in the Queen's household that draws quite heavily from my thesis. But I did leave a certain amount of information out um, that I didn't that was probably a bit too clunky. But one thing that I probably did leave out is the actual oath itself, um, which probably would have been worth quoting at length. But it is very standard across the board. It's it's almost the same as the King's household. But what is very interesting is the King's servants do not swear to the queen necessarily they only swear to their master the king whereas there is this sort of proviso or sort of this sort of condition in this oath of the queen servants that seems to clear up and or attempts to clear up that they are sworn to the queen yes as their mistress but also the king as their sovereign and why they must have felt it worth like necessary to actually put that extra statement in there or those extra few words maybe there was something that had occurred. But the problem is we don't actually have the oath that Catherine of Aragon's um, servants initially swore in 1509. So my suspicion there maybe is that it didn't exist before in 1509, maybe, that they were sworn definitely to Henry and Catherine, but maybe it wasn't made as clear as it was, um, say, in the oath to Catherine Parr, um, sorry, the oath taken by Catherine Parr's servants. So that by the end of the reign, that oath does survive and makes it ex like, you know very clear that they were loyal to the king first. Maybe it wasn't so clear in Catherine of Aragon's oath because, well, as as you know, it it sort of leads to many problems in Catherine of Aragon's household. But I think the power of an oath is sort of overstated um, by some historians. I think, yes, although we have to understand that those who took the oath would have seen it as an act before God, and that would have been taken incredibly seriously practically and you know day to day would that really have been wearing on their mind i'm i'm not not maybe not N not so much as i imagine their loyalties to the queen in a personal you know a much more powerful and compelling way is the relationship that they had with the queen not the oath that they had sworn to them the oath thing has been an interest of mine i think ever since i started researching thomas seymour because i had looked and looked and looked for whatever the oath was that he would have sworn. And I could never find one. So when I read your book, I had this aha moment, like I really need to talk to James about this. Right, <laughs> I should have printed it. I, I, I There is definitely um, a few surviving oaths. And for the King's servants, definitely, I'm, there are a few. I love it. But, where, but now that I think about it, where are they printed? Are they even printed? I'm not sure that they are. So that, that could be something, maybe there's more work to be done on oaths, I think, actually, mm. in this period. Book number two. 
No, oh no! Oh god! I've I've done enough on oaths. My goodness! I well maybe we'll see. <laughs> never say never, right? That's right. Actually, yes. Never say never. I also found it really interesting while reading your book where you talked about queenly loans, but in particular, you told the story about Elizabeth of York having to borrow money from her women. Can you tell us more about that? <laughs> Yes, it's quite extraordinary, really. I mean, at first glance, it sounds impossible. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but Elizabeth of York's accounts reveal that she was often borrowing money from her women. But I think many of these entries represent a situation which would have arose where imagine the queen is sort of walking from her chambers and there's a visitor at court or um, a poor man or woman who is asking for help. And Elizabeth caught sort of unaware and probably without money on her person, would maybe have beckoned over one of her ladies and gentlewomen to sort of meet the cost. And the accounts then reflect that she reimburses them later. But then on the other hand, Elizabeth's husband, um, King Henry VII, he ha does have the reputation, which is contested, but he has the reputation of being a bit of a miser, a bit of a sort of, you know, a bit greedy. And I would probably have to do more work on Elizabeth's allowance as queen. I mean, she surely would, she would, she would have been far from impoverished. She would not have wanted for anything, but I can imagine maybe petty cash might have been short on occasion. And maybe that's what is in the accounts that her ladies had to use their own cash to sort of make sure that the queen's honor was met in those moments. Um, and that, that function of women conveying money on behalf of their mistress is not exclusive to Elizabeth. It's definitely in the accounts of Anne of Cleves too. And there is no impression in in these other accounts that they they need they're short of money necessarily. But yeah, it's um it is interesting. And I, again, I, I would I, I think it's another area where I could absolutely afford to look at it closer. It's just it's in, it's incredible. It's just an, a strange power dynamic almost. But I I do think it was probably just the norm. I think it was just it was like a, a function of the servants to have money on their person rather than the queen carrying it herself in a little purse. Well, let's shift back to the royal household, the more inner workings of it. Can we discuss how maybe the queen's women entertained her? What did they do for fun? Because I always hear Anne of Cleves enjoyed playing cards and dice. Was this across the board with all Tudor consorts? Uh, okay, yes, that's a great question. I'm Something I tried to do in the book was to measure this balance that was struck by queens between piety and pastime. So although the court definitely had its more menial routines like mealtimes or religious ceremonial, there was definitely time for dancing, singing, writing and reciting poetry, idle conversation between queens and their servants. And whereas Henry and his gentlemen, you know, they might have went out hunting, hawking and did archery. And, you know, so did the queen's servants too. I think they would have accompanied them often. The queens and their ladies also often engaged in needlework. And as you say, they played music, cards, dice, word games even. Um, it's, it is clear enough that pretty much all queens would have been engaged in some pastime, but maybe not have indulged in it to the same extent that others did. And I think, again, just to use that example of Jane Seymour coming from Anne Boleyn's court, that the, it, it might reflect the climate of the court. So in reaction to Anne's fall, that it seems like perhaps Jane wanted a more strict, staid, sort of, you know, very calm, quiet, <laughs> boring household. <laughs> but actually, you know, really, in I, I reckon because it was the court, you know, the court itself had this entertaining sort of culture of, you know, merriment and, and fun. And the Queen's household would never have been exempt from that, even if at times they probably needed to have been. Um, and certainly Anne's court, Anne Boleyn's court, reads as the most fun and sort of the survival of certain very fragmentary evidence. But the survival of some evidence is really indicative of what kind, what, what court culture was like. And the, the classic example that I can think of off the top of my head is the Devonshire manuscript. So it's uh, 200 poems of courtly verse, which we know many of Anne's women, well, a few of Anne's women, I should say, composed and circulated these poems. And it sort of suggests that they took great pleasure in in partaking in these rituals, you know, courtly love rituals and the chivalric sort of culture and where knights would woo them. And, you know, it, it's kind of you get you, you you get the sense that actually serving the queen wasn't all about, you know, 
making sure that she was dressed properly or didn't want for anything. It's it sounds like life at court was much more enjoyable, and th- then maybe some some of your listeners might first anticipate. Anne Boleyn became Henry's queen as she had promised to bring him a son. One of the things that we hear about is Henry had mistresses. Catherine of Aragon had a way of looking away and pretending like it didn't bother her. But Mm. Anne, of course, had been the mistress and had convinced him, I'll just say had convinced him, to leave his wife for her. Now, she becomes pregnant and she's kind of in the same situation now. Uh, The king has needs. He's going to look for somebody to fulfill his needs. Can we talk about... Jane Boleyn's involvement in Henry's mistress in 1534, because there isn't a lot known about her. But one of the things that you brought forward in your book that I had never heard before was that this new young mistress was actually a friend of his daughter Mary's. Right. Yes. I mean, that's if if we can believe Eustace Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, who if we are being completely honest, definitely stoked the fires a little bit back home in sort of defending Catherine and Mary and probably saw everything at court relating to Catherine and Mary in some respect, even when it didn't. But I, and you know, to to be honest, he, it was not unusual for him to sort of maybe imagine groups or factions at court. I, I say imagine because they even say the word faction in regards to Henry VIII's court is quite controversial and that's opening up a whole can of worms and I'm, I probably <laughs> shouldn't even go there. But I think Chapuis was a little bit paranoid at times, especially when it, with concerns for Catherine and Mary and would often see, you know, the sort of machinations of court involving them even when they weren't there. It's 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 kind of a strange thing. So whereas I don't really know how close this um, mistress really was to Princess Mary, I don't think Chapuis would make it up, you know, maybe a little bit paranoid, but I don't think he would just fabricate these details. His purports were meant to be, um, they were intended to be truthful. They were meant to be genuine. And I think although, yes, he maybe he could see alliances where, you know, maybe read a little bit too much into whispers at court. I, I, I don't find it implausible that one of Henry's mistresses was close with Mary. Mary had a fantastic network, even in her younger years. She had so many people who knew and revered her. And, you know, when even when Anne Boleyn was queen, especially, there were definitely men and women who did not want to see her on the throne and who thought that Catherine and Mary had been treated horrifically by the king, even if they did not dare say that. So the the appearance of this mistress who threatens in a sense, or maybe she doesn't threaten, but might threaten, and in certainly in Anne's eyes, she felt threatened, might threaten Anne's position and Anne's queenship and sort of rival her for the crown. It sounds ridiculous, but it she did set a dangerous precedent in what she achieved by marrying the king and sort of dethroning Catherine. And it's not implausible, as I was going to say, that the mistress was an adherent or rather part of the side of the court which sympathized with Mary and may even have been, as Chapuis seems to have thought, have been bold enough to send Mary letters of goodwill and reassure her that things were changing at court and probably overestimated her own influence, if, if I may say so. But it is a very interesting, the whole sort of Marian faction, I think, is a very interesting area that could definitely be done with more work. I think, I know faction at Henry's court is very contested, but there is there is something going on at court in those years with Catherine and Mary and more needs to be done on that. And I I, I certainly am interested in it myself. I think I, I would love to have the chance to look at that closer. What was Jane's involvement with the mistresses of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn at this time? She was obviously loyal to Anne, I would say, because it was her sister-in-law, but she also had a loyalty to the king. So in 1534, how does she get mixed up in all of this? Right, yes. This is the only evidence that we have really of a relationship between Jane and Anne. And often in the you know, historically, it's thought that they were bitter. They didn't like each other. They were hostile to each other. But there isn't really enough evidence to say that they were hostile. And there is evidence to say that at one point, Jane was Anne's confidant. And 
a natural one too because she's one of the family you know it makes a lot of sense in on you know when you think about it jane probably was the foremost of anne's ladies at one point especially early on in anne's reign as queen and when this is how i interpret this evidence because it comes from a report from eustace Chapri. so you have to sort you have to interpret it in some way and how i interpret it is that anne was visibly upset by the appearance of this mistress and jane went out of her way to console her and involved herself in a way which essentially risked her own position and she found herself banished from court by the king because I, th I think if I want to get this right um essentially Anne and Jane conspired if you might say um to have this mistress ousted from court by provoking her into an argument and because one of the rules of court was that you know arguments and sort of disagree disputes were sort of outlawed the, the, you had to have a certain amount of decorum and sort of um, control yourself essentially you, you weren't supposed to act out they figured I imagine that if they could provoke her then they would have the king would have no choice but to send her away but instead when they tried to provoke her it completely backfires and Jane is the one who takes the fall and I think that is a huge turning point for Jane in her life and career but the problem is I can only think it because it really is just on one report by Chapuy and then Jane disappears for a few years and it's like wow where is jane and i think the interesting thing about jane's exile is many accounts seem to suggest that she come she came back to court shortly thereafter but chapuis never mentions it and i think he would have and i there is no record of her ever being reinstated while anne boleyn was queen and i think that might be a, a clue to her actions in 1536 at anne's fall it doesn't it's not convincing enough to say that she hated anne because she sort of left her to you know rot in exile but it's a, certainly a possibility you know i think i would be a little bit embittered if i knew that my all of my friends and family were at court enjoying themselves and i had to waste away in in a manner somewhere completely on my own but there really isn't any evidence to say that that there was resentment built up for her exile so i, I don't want to lean too heavily on that mm -hmm. i just think the suggestion is definitely worth mentioning and I think this is a when I was saying this is a clue to her actions. I think it's really one of the most important things I discovered. I find um, is that when they drew up the indictments against Anne in 1536, which summarised the charges laid against her, there is no mention of the evidence that Jane provided. So when Anne remarked that the king had neither the skill nor the virility to satisfy a woman, for instance, or rather that the king was impotent, that's Jane's evidence. That's a statement that could only have come from Jane, but it is not in the indictment. And that suggests that she didn't contribute evidence initially, that she probably wasn't at court. And therefore, this is why I think that she remained in exile, because if the indictments were drawn upon the 10th or the 11th of May, and then the evidence of Jane's evidence gathered subsequently, but before the trial of her husband in 15th of May, it sort of suggests that Jane was not the initial accuser, not among the initial accusers, not in the Queen's household, and probably not at court in any context. So, and I think that's really important to understanding Jane's position at that time. And I've rambled on a bit there. That wasn't really your question. So I apologize, but I, I just, I went on a bit of a train of thought there. And I think it's interesting that when the case appears to be manifestly weak against Anne and George, I think that's when Jane becomes relevant. And anything Jane would have known in 1534 or 1533 became more important as a result. Mm. I think that was perfect. So thank you for leading us in that direction, because now I can ask you about Jane after the execution of her husband and sister-in-law. So after George was executed, Jane was left with only a small amount of money to her name. And when she asked for help, it fell to her father-in-law, Thomas Boleyn, to, you know, give her some money. And he insinuated right. that, I think maybe that he was upset that she had had no children. Like, why should I give her money? She didn't give me any grandchildren to carry on the Boleyn name. Is that a fair assessment? <laughs> I believe that is the assessment. I think that is exactly what the evidence is saying. And it's maybe it's not conclusive, but my God, isn't that an interesting, like that's so believable. It, there's something about this this um, reaction from Thomas that is so believable and understandable. And I think that the evidence says enough 
to to make us feel to make us understand how he feels about Jane. So, yes, I think it's conclusive enough that Jane and George had no children. And the more consequential evidence like wills or land grants that you'd probably expect to see in their name just doesn't exist. And I think that there was a, definitely there was no love lost between Jane and her father-in-law. Who knows if they ever got on, but definitely after the fall of Anne and George, you know, she turned against the Boleyns. She provided evidence against them. She secured their convictions and their executions. Not alone. It's not all on her, but she did definitely participate. And people knew that she participated. And this was these were two of Thomas's three children and his own his his only male heir. I mean, could he be bitter? Of course he could be bitter. And when she then asks him to raise her allowance, I just find that hilarious because it's like just digging the knife in a little bit more, you know, like why would Thomas want to help her? And I can ima- I can only imagine how Thomas must have felt when the letter comes through the door. What letter comes through the door, you know. It's a uh, but the petition is handed to him from one of the king's servants and the king is demanding that he raises Jane's allowance. I can just imagine how much he must have that 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 must have been such a tough pill to swallow, you know. <laughs> and I think Jane was really little more to him than a financial burden by that point. I always want to say poor Jane. What a tough situation. I can't even imagine what it was like to be a woman in Tudor England. I mean, we are so mm. fortunate in the 21st century with the liberties that we have that I can't right. imagine life where you're just subservient to everyone. So Anne Boleyn is executed. The new queen sits next to the king, Jane Seymour. Of course, I'm very attracted to the Seymour family. Right. But, but these women who had served Anne, what happened to them after her execution? Did they all immediately move to Jane's household? Oh, Rebecca, this question, this was the question for me that totally sparked my interest in this area. I wanted to know exactly that. I wanted to know whether or not the Queen's household represented her or whether or not it was basically the same people every time serving the Queen. And that question has changed my life because I really did pursue it to the point of doing more more and more research i was so fortunate enough to be able to do a phd in this basically and that was the question that i started with i ended up branching out from there but that is that was the essential one what happened to the queen's servants when the queen was no longer queen and when she had fallen and the evidence did sort of occasionally leave me wanting but sometimes it is clear and i think i i think i traced six women at least that actually gave evidence in some form against Anne Boleyn, who then served Jane Seymour, six. And I think that's significant. There were many, many, many more men and women who served Anne and then served Jane. And your initial impression would be, surely Jane would have wanted her own servants. But I think that there was a, an overwhelming presence in the, king, uh, sorry, in the Queen's household, which the King controlled. A lot of these servants owed their appointments to the King, and did not necessarily have undying loyalty to the queens. And that proves to be quite significant in many ways for queens in the way that they're sort of hampered by their households. They're surrounded by people that they probably know are more loyal to the to the king than they are to them. And that becomes a real problem um, quite often through Henry's reign, actually. So sort of to go back to your question, I think... Yes, we can trace servants uh, making the transition. And this is something that Jane does four times over five queens. Incredibly impressive. It's not that easy to keep your position at court during those times of sort of those tumultuous periods because the households were discharged outright. Everyone lost their right to be there. And then as soon as a new queen came around, yes, there were uh, probably a 20 yeomen of the guard who were, you know, they're, they're perfectly fit to serve a new queen than they would have the last. But then there's the more intimate servants who, why would Jane Seymour, I'm, I'm talking about Jane Seymour, why would Jane want to be attended by a woman who was clearly loyal to Anne Boleyn? Yes. I wouldn't want to be. So she do, she obviously wasn't. And there were there are men and women who just disappear from court occasionally. And the most severe it is, is between Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn and Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour. There's There's definitely people who are cut out and forfeit their careers just because they are clearly adherents of the, the former queen. And there's just, it's just not, they're not fit to serve on the new queen. They just aren't. There's, there's no, their presence would be 
mind boggling. And that leads me to say Jane Lady Rochford's presence in Jane Seymour's household is astounding. I, I just I just find that so insane. Like that to me is almost con- the most conclusive evidence of Jane Boleyn's role in turning against the Boleyns. Right. Because why would there be a Boleyn in the Seymour household? It just begs the question. Why? There's just no way. It makes no sense. Unless, unless she's proven herself to be very loyal to the king and she's owed something. And it's, my, it's, it's speculation, but it really begs an explanation. Why would Lady Rochford, Jane, be serving, on, is serving in Jane Seymour's household? It needs, it just needs an explanation. Jane should have completely disappeared. She should have been so obscure, but she wasn't. And that to me is, it's not, it's not conclusive as almost anything in Jane's, Jane's life is. It's not conclusive, but it speaks volumes to me that she was appointed to serve Jane Seymour. That is the question that kept playing over and over in my head. Why on earth would Jane be in Jane Seymour's household? It just doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense. There was no shortage of women who wanted that role. Right. Let me tell you that. It would have been every time a new queen came about, there would have been a scramble. There would have been petitions, bribes, everything. There wouldn't have been a short of candidates. So why Jane? And I think that the problem with some of my, my problem with some of the accounts is that they don't go at, they don't try and explain some things like that. I need to, I want to know that to me is such an anomaly and it, it needs an explanation. And although there's no, there's nothing we can prove about it. Surely the explanation is that she was owed something that she'd turned King's evidence or that Cromwell, why would Cromwell busy himself in Jane's interests at all? With the Tudors, and, there's always so much more to the story than what's on the surface. Absolutely. Uh, We know that there were spies at court for Woolsey and Cromwell. That's no surprise. But you suggest that maybe Jane had been a spy? Why do you think that? Right. Yes. I mean, I don't believe I'm the first to suggest this. Um, I think the original probably comes... Well, actually, I I couldn't tell you who, who said it originally, but I think I probably read it first in Julia Fox's biography. And... Although at first it might seem really absurd, it might seem strange to suggest that she's acting as a spy. Like, where is the evidence? And that was my question. I wanted to, you know, there was no evidence telling me that Jane was acting as a spy. It was just a suggestion. And I wanted to know if that was even feasible for women to be spying. I mean, I know that that might seem really obvious to say, of course they could, but I wanted the proof and I really went looking for it. Um, That was one of the key questions that I really wanted to answer when I was researching what was the role of women at court? But not just merely what did they do for the queen, but what did they maybe do for the king? And although I, I wanted to, I wanted to demonstrate that basically that it was possible. And there's no proof that she spied for Cromwell, but there is much evidence which illustrates the power of women at court as eyewitnesses, brokering information, gossip, to their own advantage often. And this is something which Jane had already shown herself to be astute enough and capable enough to do because she substantiated the evidence against George and Anne. And she would also prove to be useful in this capacity for the king in separating him from Anne of Cleves. So Cromwell's papers occasionally infer that he has knowledge of something which must have been related to him by one of the queen's servants. It's just, it comes from a place where he would never have had the opportunity to see it. And someone must have been acting as his eyes and ears on the inside. And the the most obvious example to me comes from um, Jane Seymour's illness after giving birth. The, she was surrounded by women. Jane, Lady Rochford, was very likely one of them. There is nothing to suggest that she was the one who told him this, but someone had to have told him, and that someone was a woman. There's so much to cover with your book, and we're going to run out of time. So I'm going to fast forward. Oh, right. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to her serving in Catherine Howard's household. What an interesting yeah. story we have there. <laughs> oh, well, yes. First of all, I there's one thing that I had never considered before reading your book. I'm, I'm sure maybe there had been something in the back of my mind before, but this really brought it to the forefront, that there was such a great similarity between Catherine Howard and her successor, Catherine Parr, and that it seems that both women had feelings for another man before the king came a-calling. But I think Catherine Mm. Howard maybe wasn't mature enough 
to know how to navigate that, whereas Catherine Parr knew I need to close that door because I'm going to be Queen of England. Do you have any take on that? Absolutely. You know, I'll be honest, I hadn't thought about that before because I kind of stopped short with this book at Catherine Howard. I have looked at Catherine Parr, but I never really thought about that connection. And you're absolutely right. When you said that there was a connection between them, that's great similarity. I thought, no, <laughs> I was stunned and stumped because uh -huh. I think of the, those two women as being so completely different. And I thought, where is this going? But no, you're absolutely right. Um, their experience of having maybe seemingly unable to evade the king's advances, probably very quite quite similar. They must have felt very, very, very much the same. And the material for, for Howard's infatuation with Culpepper, for instance, that is so rich. It makes her story so much more tragic and real. Like I understand her in a way. I can I can appreciate it. She comes across as such a real person. And I mean, I, I, it's a great credit to to many accounts of Catherine Howard's life, but in particular Gareth Russell's biography, that I return to it all the time when I want to read and understand this queen, Catherine Howard, because she does come. It's a shame that that's how we understand her, but her her who she is really comes through those depositions, those, and it, she almost literally speaks to you from the sources, and it's so disturbing but fascinating too. And I just, yeah, it's. I don't really have much of a take on it, but I I can only say I find it very, very, very interesting. And yes, you're absolutely right. I think Catherine Howard probably was too immature, uh, really, to to be able to navigate it appropriately. And certainly the guidance of Jane Lady Rochford did not help. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about that, because most of the people listening to the show have probably watched The Tudors, which gives us that visual representation of maybe what could have happened at the time. Do you think they gave us a fair account of Jane Rochford's involvement in Catherine Howard's, let's say, affair with Culpepper? I would have to watch it again. I've, it's been many years since I've watched uh, The Tudors in particular. But my 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 memory of it is that that they kind of made out, didn't they make out that she was quite interested in Culpepper for herself? And that is definitely plausible to me. If not necessarily, it's not always borne out in the evidence. But the, the the wonderful thing about the Tudors is it really does bring it to life to audiences and then brings them in. And for many, they go onto Wikipedia, I imagine, first, and then maybe even buy a book. And they lose themselves. They go down the rabbit hole. They want to know more. They want to know, is what I watched really, did that really happen? And I know a lot of people pan the Tudors and say it's not accurate. But some of it really is accurate. And I think that the portrayals of Lady Rochford in general, you know, if you were making a TV show, you would not think Jane had to be had to have been an innocent. You want to find the most dastardly, the most evil, the most interesting character that you can write. Um, but characters have to be compelling, too, I suppose. And you don't want to make a caricature out of someone, even though, you know, maybe the Tudors probably went there a few times. I think that most representations of Jane are fair. I think that she was an unpleasant woman, probably. And I think that her involvement in the fall of Catherine Howard is probably remains imp an impossible riddle to solve because of the way that the, the nature of the evidence. But my reading of it is that she was more involved than anyone could should ever have been. And for for one reason or another, but I kind of lean on one reason in particular, and I won't sort of spoil that for your uh, listeners in case they want to read the book, but that for one reason or another, she absolutely was guilty in, in involving herself in this affair. She was. There's To excuse it is to completely ignore the evidence of five or six people giving depositions against her. It's it's overwhelming the evidence you know she was guilty she 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 doesn't in no sense did she deserve her fate no one should have been executed for what she did no 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 definitely not but she was she was just she made many mistakes in those last years i'll just say that mm -hmm. one of the underlining themes in your book which actually took me a little bit to see while i was reading it was that any of the queen's household had sworn an oath to her However, the king superseded any oath to a consort, so they should have been most loyal to him, meaning that Jane was expected to be loyal to him and not her mistress, so she should have reported Catherine Howard's behavior to the king, right? 
Yes, definitely. I'm so glad you said that because that was essentially my conclusion from the evidence that to some, this might seem really obvious, but the mental, emotional, sometimes financial consequences of this conflict that occurred in this reign between queen and king for the, and for those who served them is a major theme of the book. It's kind of, you know, Henry, Henry VIII's reign, his marital instability directly impacted not just the lives of his wives, but the lives and careers of those who served them, those who were nearest to them. And I think and I, well, I prob it's probably, well, it's my hope that my contribution to the scholarship, if there is one, is to give recognition or due attention to how the power of a king or a tyrant, if you want to say that, had sort of rippling political, religious, domestic implications too. And it is almost immeasurable, but measure it to some extent I did in this book, I think. Okay, here's the question of the hour. Are you ready? <laughs> Uh, oh, wow. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> the release of your research has had, let's say, some pushback from defenders of Jane, and all of them are women. And as a woman myself, right. I do understand that there's a desire to have a story about a woman from history told fairly and not from a male perspective. Yeah. How do you push back on the claims that you're a misogynist for having the standard view of Jane? <sighs> yes. So... Okay, well, forgive me. I'm asking your listeners to forgive me if my answer is a little too diplomatic here. But I had in, I had anticipated that this book would have pushback. Many recent interpretations of Jane's life find her to be innocent, wherein the evidence to me speaks of a woman who, you know, perhaps was not evil or wicked, but we can do away with those words for sure. But she was definitely meddlesome, clever, ambitious, calculating involved she was involved why excuse her when she was involved it doesn't make any sense to me and it makes for such a fantastic story that for many they're just they just this they they're so determined to see jane in a certain way that it, they just dismiss the evidence it doesn't make any sense to me she was no innocent the evidence makes that clear enough for me and but apparently by suggesting you know that jane could have been rather more bad than she was good means i'm a misogynist and I found that so disappointing and disheartening. Um, I mean, I have really dedicated, this is no exaggeration, the past 10 years of my life to studying women. And what those sort of, as you say, defenders of Jane seem to have missed or ignored is that I find her, Jane, to be remarkable, brilliant even. You know, she is such a fantastic study, a wonderful subject. And I wouldn't have written a book about her just to slander her name. I wanted to understand her and not just just to excuse her because that's, you know, the sort of that's what we want to believe, but to rather explain her actions. And, you know, these actions have confounded historians for centuries and there is room for many interpretations. I'm not saying mine is right, but she definitely Jane to me proves to be an excellent case study of a woman who in a period when we're told women, you know, they're, they're like hapless pawns she demonstrated that she, like men at court, could be a politician, she could be a courtier, a confidant, a, a patron, an agent, an informant. And it's her power, her sort of talent for intrigue, for which I think she has to be remembered. That's for what she should be remembered. And is that misogynistic? Is that anti-feminist? Well, if you want to read James's research in this book, I think that's the best route to go to form your own opinion. Always do the reading. James, where can people find your book? Well, Rebecca, thank you. They're, they can find it exclusively on Amazon at the moment. It should be available in all markets on Amazon, wherever you are in the world. Um, but it, that's, that's where you'll find it. Wonderful. And we'll include a link in the show notes to send them directly to Amazon if they want to check oh, it out. Oh, thank you. Yes. Very generous. Dr. James Taft, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I've, I've, it's been thrilling. I loved it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.